It was a warm summer day, about two years ago, when I decided to embark on one of my usual long walks through the woods. Walking in nature was something I loved, especially during the summer months when everything was lush and green. On this particular day, I set out early, prepared for a day of exploration. Armed with a book, food, water, and a first aid kit, I felt ready for whatever the day had in store. The woodland I frequented was vast, with numerous winding paths that led deeper into the forest. But this time, I decided to veer off my usual route and walk alongside a river. The path was less traveled, more remote, and the sound of the rushing water added a soothing backdrop to my journey. As hours passed, I delved deeper into the woods, following the meandering riverbank. Despite the beauty surrounding me, an unsettling feeling began to gnaw at me. It was a sensation I couldn't shake off, an instinctual unease that grew stronger with every step. The loneliness of the remote path only amplified my discomfort. Normally at ease in the outdoors, I found myself constantly glancing over my shoulder, scanning the dense foliage behind me. I brushed off my growing apprehension, chiding myself for letting my imagination run wild. But the feeling persisted, a nagging presence at the back of my mind. Then, suddenly, as if materializing from the shadows, a cloaked figure emerged from the underbrush. My heart leaped into my throat, and a wave of alarm washed over me. The figure wore a mask, reminiscent of a plague doctor, its features obscured by the grotesque visage. I wanted to flee, to run as far and as fast as my legs would carry me. But some stubborn part of me refused to give in to fear. Instead, I forced myself to maintain composure, to act unfazed by the eerie encounter. Okay, good one, I managed to stammer out, my voice betraying the tremor of unease beneath the surface. I'll be on my way now. The figure remained silent, its head tilting to the side as I awkwardly sidestepped around it and continued down the path. It stood there, an ominous sentinel, its gaze fixed upon me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. Determined to appear unaffected, I pressed on, each step heavy with the weight of mounting dread. But when I finally summoned the courage to steal a glance behind me, the figure still loomed in the distance, a dark silhouette against the dappled light filtering through the trees. A sense of foreboding gripped me as I quickened my pace my nerves fraying with each passing moment. And then, in a chilling display of malevolence, the figure raised a hand in a mocking wave, a gesture laden with sinister intent. My resolve shattered, replaced by a primal instinct to flee. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I broke into a desperate sprint, the rhythmic pounding of my footsteps drowned out by the cacophony of my racing heartbeat. But the figure was relentless, its pursuit relentless, its unearthly cries echoing through the forest like the anguished wails of a lost soul. Panic seized me as I stumbled over roots and rocks, my lungs burning with exertion. It felt like an eternity before I finally burst into the open, the welcome sight of other people bringing a flood of relief. Gasping for breath, I stumbled toward them, my words tumbling out in a frantic rush as I tried to convey the horror that lurked in the depths of the woods. The encounter was reported to the authorities, but the investigation yielded no answers. The memory of that day still haunts me, a specter that lingers in the recesses of my mind, a reminder of the darkness that dwells just beyond the edge of our perception. I've always been fascinated by the unknown the kind of secrets that lie hidden in the dark corners of the world, waiting to be uncovered. That's probably why I didn't hesitate when Jake suggested we camp in Glen Ridge Forest for the weekend. It'll be an adventure, he said, his eyes gleaming with the thrill of it all. I should have known better. Adventures in places like Glen Ridge Forest don't always end with happy campfire stories. But there I was, packing my bag with a flashlight, a tent, and too much enthusiasm. The forest was notorious, not just for its eerie beauty, but for the legends that cloaked it like the thick fog that hugged its ancient trees. They said it was home to the Veiled One, a creature that instilled terror in the bravest of hearts. Of course, we all thought it was just a story, 
something to add a bit of spice to our camping trip. How naive we were. As we set up camp in a moonlit clearing, the forest felt alive, whispering secrets in a language too ancient for us to understand. The towering trees cast long shadows that danced around our campfire, as if they were trying to communicate with us. For a moment, I felt like we were intruders in a world that wasn't meant for us, but the excitement of the night ahead quickly washed away any unease. Our laughter filled the clearing, stories were shared, and for a while, everything seemed perfect. But as the night wore on, a chill settled over us. It wasn't just the cold, it was as if the very air around us had changed, becoming denser, heavier. Jake threw another log on the fire, but the warmth it provided did little to comfort us. That's when we noticed the mist. It slithered through the underbrush like a living thing, wrapping the trees in a ghostly embrace. The forest had taken on a different character, one that was far from welcoming. The laughter died down, replaced by hushed whispers, as if we were afraid to break the silence that had enveloped us. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my head, that the stories of the Veiled One were just that, stories. But the feeling of being watched was undeniable. It wasn't long before everyone felt it, a presence that was felt rather than seen. An evil force, stirring the essence of fear in our hearts. We huddled closer to the fire, seeking safety in its flickering light. But the darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides. The temperature dropped further, and the eerie mist continued to spread, wrapping everything in a spectral embrace. It was as if the forest itself was alive, aware of our presence, and it didn't want us there. In the distance, a branch snapped, and we all jumped, our eyes searching the shadows for signs of the Veiled One. Was it just a story? Or was there something out there, in the deepest, darkest corners of the forest, watching us? We should have left then, packed up our things and returned to the safety of our homes. But we didn't. We stayed, drawn by the thrill of the unknown, the adventure we had sought. Little did we know, the adventure was about to turn into a nightmare. The Veiled One was more than just a legend, and we were about to find out just how real it could be. The night had wrapped its cold fingers around us, and the fire seemed to be the only thing keeping the creeping dread at bay. But nature called, and I found myself volunteering to step away from the camp. I'll be back in a minute, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. The truth was, the darkness beyond our little circle of light terrified me. But I couldn't admit that, not in front of my friends. As I walked away from the campfire, the forest seemed to close in around me. The once friendly chatter of my friends faded, replaced by the oppressive silence of the woods. Every step took me further into the darkness, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I remembered the stories of the Veiled One, and a shiver ran down my spine. It's just a story, I whispered to myself, but the words sounded hollow in the thick air of the forest. Suddenly, the ground beneath me felt unfamiliar. Damp leaves muffled my steps, making my progress silent but unnervingly slow. The shadows seemed to elongate, twisting into grotesque shapes that played tricks on my mind. Then I heard it, a whisper, barely audible, murmuring my name from the shadows. I froze, my breath caught in my throat. It was as if the forest itself was alive, speaking to me, drawing me deeper into its labyrinth. Panic set in as familiar landmarks blurred, and I realized I was lost. The once familiar trees now stood like looming specters, their branches reaching out as if to snatch me from the path. The moon, my only source of light, struggled to pierce the thick canopy above, leaving me enveloped in darkness. I stumbled through the underbrush, my heart pounding in my chest. The whispers grew into chants, resonating with an ancient power that I could feel vibrating through the ground beneath my feet. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, and for a moment, I thought I saw a pair of glowing eyes materialize before me, the eyes of the Veiled One. A guttural growl echoed through the darkness, and every instinct in my body screamed at me to run. I turned and sprinted back towards the camp, branches clawing at my face and roots trying to trip me with every step. The creature, whatever it was, was hot on my heels. 
I could feel its presence, a malevolent force pushing me to the brink of despair. Desperation fueled my legs, and I burst into the clearing where our campsite should have been. But it wasn't there. In its place was a barren expanse of twisted roots and cold earth. The whispers intensified, now a cacophony of hateful voices mocking my fear. I spun around, searching for any sign of the camp, of my friends, but there was nothing just the darkness and the veiled one closing in. I turned to face the creature, my back against the unseen. Its form remained hidden, a looming figure wreathed in shadows. The whispers grew louder, drowning out my screams as it enveloped me in inky tendrils. I fought against the darkness, but it was useless. The veiled one had claimed me, dragging me into the abyss of the forest. My last thought before succumbing to the terror was a wish that I had never ventured into the shadows of Glenridge Forest. The darkness consumed me, its inky tendrils wrapping around me tighter and tighter until I could barely breathe. I had faced my fears head on, turning to confront the Veiled One, but nothing could have prepared me for this moment. The forest around me was alive with malevolence, each whisper and chant piercing through me with a chilling intensity. I was alone, utterly alone in the heart of darkness, my friends nowhere to be seen, and the creature before me a nightmare made flesh. I could feel its presence, a suffocating evil that seemed to drain the very life out of me. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat a deafening drum in the silence that followed. I wanted to scream, to run, but my legs wouldn't move. I was frozen, caught in the gaze of those glowing eyes that seemed to see right through me. The whispers grew louder, a torrent of voices that filled the night with their hatred and malice. They called to me, mocking my fear, my desperation. I knew then that I wasn't just facing a creature of the forest. I was facing the embodiment of every dark tale and nightmare that had ever been whispered about Glenridge Forest. The Veiled One was real, and it had chosen me. In a final act of defiance, I tried to speak to shout anything that would break the spell of fear that held me. But my voice was lost in the roar of the whispers, as meaningless as a leaf in a storm. The veiled one advanced, and I could see it now, a shadow among shadows, its form shifting and undulating like smoke. It was the darkness itself, a creature born from the fears of countless souls who had wandered these woods before me. As it enveloped me, I felt a cold unlike any other, a chill that seeped into my bones and threatened to snuff out the last spark of life within me. I thought of my friends, of the laughter and joy we had shared before this nightmare began. Would they even remember me? Would they ever know what happened in the heart of Glenridge Forest? The next thing I knew, I was waking up to the light of dawn. The forest was peaceful, the morning sun filtering through the trees in gentle beams. I was lying on the ground, my friends asleep around the dying embers of our campfire. Had it all been a dream? A nightmare fueled by the chilling tales of the Veiled One? But as I tried to stand, I felt a weakness in my limbs, a reminder of the terror I had faced. The whispers were gone, but their echo remained, a haunting memory of the night. My friends stirred, waking to a new day, oblivious to the darkness that had claimed me. I never spoke of what happened, of the Veiled One or the terror it inspired. Some secrets are too dark, too deep to share. But the forest knew, and somewhere in its shadowy heart, I knew the Veiled One still waited, patient and eternal, for the next unsuspecting soul to wander into its domain. The Veiled One was more than just a legend. It was a warning, a guardian of the forest's darkest secrets. And I, the only one to face it and survive, was left with a burden too heavy to bear. The forest had changed me, marking me as one of its own, forever entwined with the whispers of Glenridge Forest. Part 1. The vast, untouched wilderness of northern Michigan sprawled out like a living, breathing entity. The land, a sprawling canvas of pastures and forests, belonged to the earth in a way that few places did anymore. In the heart of this untamed expanse lay a farm, 
a 5,000-acre testament to a family's connection to the wild. Alia's family, seasoned outdoorsmen to the core, thrived in the isolation that the vast property afforded them. Ilia, with her tomboy ways, felt as much a part of the forest as the deer that tread silently through its depths. She grew up roaming the dense woods, a shadow among shadows, learning the language of the land from her family. Her father, uncles, and brothers were her guides, teaching her the secrets of survival and the respect due to the wilderness. Among her uncles, Theo stood out, a colossus of a man with a reputation that seemed to precede him through the forest itself. His military background, combined with his prowess as a hunter, had always painted him as a figure larger than life. To Ilya, he was a hero, an embodiment of strength and fearlessness. But even heroes have their Achilles' heel, a fact Ilya would come to learn in a way that would haunt her for years to come. It was during deer season, a time when the forest whispered with the movements of creatures both seen and unseen, that Theo encountered something that would forever change him. He returned to the farmhouse much earlier than expected, his usual composed demeanor shattered like thin ice underfoot. Tears streamed down his face, a sight so alien it rooted Alia to the spot. Her once invincible uncle was trembling, the color drained from his face, as if he had glimpsed the very specter of death itself. Theo's distress sent ripples of fear through the family. His mother, Aelia's grandmother, was the first to reach his side, her voice a mixture of concern and confusion as she tried to pierce the veil of his terror. But Theo was beyond words, caught in the grip of a shock so profound it seemed to have unmoored him from reality. All he could muster were fragmented sentences, hints of a creature that defied explanation a being that walked like a man but bore the fur and features of a beast, a nightmarish fusion that his mind struggled to accept. In response, the men of the house mobilized with a sense of urgency that bordered on panic. Shotguns in hand, they prepared to confront whatever had driven one of their own to the brink of madness. Aelia, driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, attempted to follow, only to be stopped by her father's stern command to stay indoors. As the men disappeared into the encroaching darkness, a heavy silence settled over the farm. Ilya remained at her window, watching, waiting, the taste of fear sharp on her tongue. Hours passed, the night deepening into an inky blackness that seemed to swallow the sounds of the forest whole. When the men finally returned, their faces were etched with a gravity that spoke volumes. No words were exchanged, no explanations offered, Yet the message was clear. The wilderness they thought they knew had revealed a face so dark, so unfathomable, it threatened to engulf them all. And for Theo, the encounter marked the beginning of a descent into a personal hell from which he would never truly escape. Part 2. The forest holds its breath, the silence a tangible presence that wraps around Chuck as he makes his way through the dense underbrush of Pennsylvania's wilderness. A seasoned hunter, accustomed to the subtle language of the woods, he senses an anomaly in the air, a deviation from the norm that sets his instincts on edge. His footsteps, muffled by a carpet of fallen leaves, are the only sound in the otherwise unnerving stillness. Far from Michigan's sprawling landscapes, the tales of unexplained phenomena in the wilderness are not confined by state lines. The hunters, each with their own stories, share a common thread, a confrontation with the inexplicable that challenges the very fabric of their understanding of the natural world. Chuck's heart races, not from the exertion of the hunt, but from a growing sense of unease. The fading light, swallowed by the thick canopy above, adds an eerie quality to the evening casting long shadows that seem to dance at the corner of his vision. It's in this twilight realm that Chuck hears it, a voice, unmistakably his brother's, calling out to him from behind a thicket. Help, Chuck. Come over here. I'm in trouble. Help. The blood in his veins turns to ice. His brother is miles away, in the arid landscapes of Nevada, a fact that roots Chuck to the spot. The voice, laden with urgency and fear, beckons again, a siren call that tempts him with the instinct to aid. Yet, the incongruity of the situation, 
the silence that now returns, suffocates any action he might have taken. Turning on his heel, Chuck flees, the underbrush tearing at his clothes as if trying to hold him back. The woods, once a haven, now loom over him, a sinister maze from which he must escape. Miles away, in a private hunting ground, Jeff's story unfolds under the cloak of darkness. Accompanied by a friend, their night hunt is interrupted by the sight of a shadowy figure, towering and impossibly tall, standing sentinel beside a greenhouse. The figure, a dark outline against the lesser darkness of the night, watches them, an unspoken threat that chills Jeff to the bone. The encounter spirals into madness as strange noises encircle them, unseen entities that mock with clicking sounds and whispers just out of sight. Their flashlight, a feeble defense against the enveloping darkness, dims inexplicably, draining their last vestige of security and plunging them into a darkness so complete it feels alive. Jeff and his friend, bound by a shared terror, abandon the hunt, the promise of the day turned nightmare. The subsequent events, marked by inexplicable injuries and haunting visions, blur the lines between reality and the realm of nightmares, leaving scars that no daylight can heal. As these tales weave into the fabric of the narrative, the wilderness becomes a character of its own, a vast, unknowable entity that harbors secrets dark and ancient. The hunters, once masters of their domain, now stand as mere mortals faced with the realization that some mysteries are not meant to be uncovered and some echoes in the wilderness are better left unanswered. Part 3. The Texas Night is a world unto itself, a vast expanse where the line between the known and the unknowable blurs. Petro, with years of military discipline hardwired into his veins, scans the horizon, his eyes a pair of unyielding sentinels against the encroaching dark. The land beneath his feet, shared with his partner, is familiar yet tonight. It whispers secrets that raise the hairs on the back of his neck. Their target, feral hogs, creatures as unpredictable as the Texas weather, have yet to show. But it's not the hogs that unsettle Petro. It's the silence, a heavy, oppressive blanket that smothers the usual cacophony of nocturnal life. Then, breaking the silence, a sound. Mechanical, almost alien in nature, it whirs from the left, soaring overhead before disappearing into the night. Both men exchange glances, a wordless agreement that some things defy explanation. Days later, the tranquility of their home is shattered by a distant boom, a sound so powerful it vibrates through the very foundation of the house. The men search for answers, scouring news channels and the internet, only to find their experience mirrors an incident from years past, unexplained then, unexplained now. Meanwhile, in the northeastern expanse of Minnesota, Noah, a newcomer to the wilderness's untold stories, faces his own confrontation with the unseen. His property, a new beginning for his family, hides shadows among its trees, shadows that move with intent. A broken downspout during a rainstorm is what first pulls him into the night, but it's the eye shine, unnaturally bright and unblinking, that holds him captive. Even after the encounter, as he tries to rationalize what he saw, the memory of those glowing eyes haunts him, a harbinger of the mysteries his new land holds. The wilderness, in these tales, is not just a backdrop. It's a living, breathing entity that watches, waits, and sometimes reaches out. Petro's aerial anomalies and the inexplicable boom that shook their home speak of a world where not all predators walk on the ground. Noah's introduction to his property's darker aspects, through eyes that shine with an unnatural light, marks the beginning of a journey into the heart of the unknown. As Petro and his partner face the skies with wary eyes, and Noah confronts the land he thought he knew, they stand on the threshold of a world where the rules of nature as they understand them no longer apply. The unseen predators, whether cloaked in the mystery of an unidentifiable sound, or hidden in the darkness with eyes that glow with an otherworldly light, remind them that in the wilderness, man is not always the apex predator. Their stories, threads in a larger tapestry, weave a narrative of caution and curiosity, of men who look beyond the veil of the natural world and glimpse the inexplicable. 
It's a reminder that for all our advancements, for all our bravery, we are but visitors in a world that predates us, a world that harbors secrets we are only beginning to understand. Part 4 The land whispered of ancient times, of secrets buried deep beneath the earth's embrace. Noah, with the wilderness as his canvas, had begun to paint his family's future in strokes of green and brown, unaware of the shadows that lurked in the corners of his masterpiece. The peculiar rise in the landscape, a subtle mound that barely registered against the vastness of the property, had drawn his attention not for its appearance, but for the unease it seated in his heart. As the days shortened and the shadows lengthened, the mound became a focal point for strange occurrences that defied rational explanation. Noah's son, a boy with a keen sense of adventure and a burgeoning respect for the wild, recounted tales of figures that moved with an eerie grace, of watchers in the woods that bore no tracks in the snow. These stories, once dismissed as the product of an active imagination, began to form a pattern, a tapestry of mystery that Noah could no longer ignore. The lore surrounding burial mounds passed down through generations and whispered around campfires, spoke of guardians of the dead, of spirits bound to the earth that watched over the resting places of ancient peoples. These tales, once regarded as nothing more than folklore, took on a new significance as Noah delved deeper into the history of the land he now called home. Armed with a sense of foreboding and a determination to protect his family, Noah embarked on a journey to uncover the truth of the mound. The air around it seemed charged with an invisible energy, a palpable tension that made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. It was as if the very ground beneath his feet held its breath, waiting, watching. The encounters escalated, each more unsettling than the last. Noah's son and a friend, bold in the camaraderie of youth, faced a figure that defied explanation, a gaunt specter that stood impossibly tall, its intentions obscured by the darkness. Their flight back to the safety of the house, hearts pounding with primal fear, marked a turning point for Noah. The land he had sought to tame bore secrets that refused to be buried. As Noah stood on the mound, the weight of the unexplained bearing down on him, he realized that some mysteries were not meant for the light of day. The guardians of the mound, whether spirits of the past or manifestations of something beyond current understanding, demanded respect, a silent pact between the living and the dead. The burial mound, a relic of a bygone era, served as a reminder of the thin veil that separates our world from the one that lies just beyond our grasp. In his quest for understanding, Noah had stumbled upon a truth that many spend lifetimes searching for, that the wilderness, for all its beauty and majesty, harbors shadows that dance just out of sight, whispering of times and tales long forgotten. The chapter closes on Noah, a man changed by the land, who looks upon his domain with new eyes. The mysteries of the mound, like the forest that surrounds it, remain, a silent testament to the depth of the unknown that threads through the very fabric of our world. Part 5 in the heart of Michigan's wilderness, where the dense canopy forms a barrier between the sky and the earth, the legacy of Theo's encounter with the unexplainable casts a long shadow over Ilya's family. The land, once a source of sustenance and joy, now harbors a palpable sense of foreboding, a constant reminder of the thin line between the known and the unknown. Theo, a man whose very presence once signified strength and security, had become a ghost of his former self, his life unraveling thread by thread in the aftermath of that fateful day in the forest. His descent into a world of isolation and despair was a wound that never truly healed, leaving scars not only on his psyche, but also on the fabric of the family. Ilya, now older, and bearing the weight of the legacy left behind by her uncle, reflects on the transformation that overtook their lives. The land, a character in its own right, had witnessed their joys and sorrows, standing silently as the family grappled with the aftermath of an encounter that defied explanation. The farm, a sprawling expanse of beauty and mystery, had become a battleground where the boundaries between reality and the inexplicable blurred. 
The consequences of that day, the ripples of Theo's encounter, had extended beyond the confines of the forest, touching each member of the family in profound and lasting ways. The rules by which they had lived, the understanding of the world as they knew it, had been irrevocably altered. The wilderness, once a place of adventure and exploration, now whispered of unseen dangers, of secrets best left undisturbed. As Ilya stands at the edge of the forest, the setting sun casting long shadows that reach towards her like fingers, she contemplates the legacy of the unknown that her family has inherited. The experiences shared by Chuck, Jeff, Petro, and Noah, each a thread in a larger tapestry, underscore the vastness of the mysteries that lie hidden within the natural world, a reminder of our place within a universe that remains largely uncharted. The chapter, and the story, closes on a note of acceptance and respect for the wilderness and its secrets. Ilya, and those like her who have come face to face with the inexplicable, carry forward a legacy of caution and reverence for the land and its unseen inhabitants. The mysteries of the forest, of the burial mound, and of the encounters that have left indelible marks on the lives of those who dared to venture too deep, remain unsolved, a testament to the enduring allure of the unknown. In the end, the legacy of the unknown is not one of fear, but of fascination, a call to acknowledge the limits of our understanding and to approach the natural world with a sense of wonder and humility. For in the heart of the wilderness, where the shadows dance and the land whispers secrets carried on the wind, lies the true essence of the mystery that is life itself. The night was thick with the kind of darkness that seemed to swallow up everything in its path, enveloping the world in an eerie shroud. I had seen them before, those haunting figures that prowled the woods surrounding Memphis. Tall, humanoid, and utterly terrifying, they moved with an otherworldly grace, their blacked-out eyes betraying no hint of emotion or intent. It was Thanksgiving Day in 2020, a time when most were nestled snugly in their homes, feasting with loved ones. But for me, it was different. I found myself on the outskirts of the city, visiting a veteran friend who had fallen on hard times. His makeshift home, a rundown camper, sat at the edge of the woods, a lonely sentinel against the encroaching darkness. Between his camper and the thick veil of trees stood the remnants of an old trailer, torn asunder by a tornado years ago. A solitary streetlight perched on a pole illuminated the desolate scene, casting long, eerie shadows that danced in the night. And there, amidst the wreckage, I saw them. At first, they seemed like nothing more than shadows, lurking in the darker corners where the light failed to reach. But as I peered closer, I realized the truth. They were beings, strange and ethereal, their forms barely discernible in the gloom. I turned to my friend, my voice trembling with unease, and asked about the figures in the distance. But he merely shrugged, dismissing them as a common occurrence. They've always been there, he muttered, his tone tinged with resignation. They don't bother us. But I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that gnawed at my insides. With the instincts of a soldier, I retrieved my firearm from my vehicle and set out towards the creatures, determined to unravel the mystery that lay shrouded in the darkness. As I drew closer, their forms began to take shape. Solid white, with eyes as black as the void itself, they moved in strange jerky motions that sent shivers down my spine. There were dozens of them, scattered across the field and lurking at the edge of the tree line, their presence like a specter haunting the night. But as I approached, something changed. They turned towards me, their empty gaze fixing upon my soul with an intensity that chilled me to the bone. Fear washed over me like a tidal wave, paralyzing me in place as I stood before these unearthly beings. In that moment, I knew I had to retreat. With a sense of urgency born of primal instinct, I turned on my heel and fled, dragging my friend along in my wake. We sought refuge in my home, far from the darkness that lurked beyond the trees. But the encounter stayed with me, haunting my dreams and plaguing my thoughts. 
night after night, I found myself drawn back to the woods, compelled by an insatiable curiosity to unravel the secrets they held. Yet no matter how hard I tried, the creatures remained elusive, vanishing into thin air at the slightest hint of pursuit. They defied logic and reason, existing on the fringes of reality like phantoms in the night. I sought answers wherever I could find them, scouring the depths of the internet for clues to their origin and purpose. But the truth eluded me, slipping through my fingers like grains of sand. And so, I am left with nothing but questions and fear, haunted by the memory of those strange and enigmatic beings that roam the woods around Memphis. They are a mystery that may never be solved, a riddle wrapped in darkness and shrouded in secrecy. My name's Hinrich, and I guess you could say I was at a bit of a crossroads in life. I worked as a forklift driver at this huge furniture company in Husvar, a small town in Sweden that not many have heard of. It was a decent job, nothing too fancy, but it paid the bills. Life in Husvar was simple, predictable, and for a while, it felt like enough. After finishing school, I moved there with some buddies who landed jobs at the same company. We were a tight-knit group, always hanging out after work, talking about everything and nothing. Life was good, you know. I even met a girl, and for a while, everything seemed perfect. But as they say, all good things come to an end. By 2007, things started to change. My girlfriend and I broke up. It wasn't messy or anything. Just one of those things where you realize you're not right for each other. At the same time, my friends began moving away, one by one, chasing their own dreams in different parts of Sweden, or even abroad. Husvar, once a place full of familiar faces and good memories, started feeling empty. I'd walk down the streets, past the coffee shop where we used to hang out, the park where we'd have barbecues in the summer, and it all just felt hollow. I missed my friends, missed having people to share the day-to-day -day with. And that's when the thought hit me. Maybe it was time for a change. I started thinking about moving back to Karlstad, my childhood town, it's about 300 kilometers north of Husvar, close to the Norwegian border. My parents and some old friends still live there, and the idea of going back, starting fresh, it was tempting. Then, out of the blue, I got a call from Tobias, an old friend who had moved to Oslo for work. He mentioned that forklift drivers were in high demand in Norway, and the pay was almost three times what I made in Sweden. That conversation was the final push I needed. The prospect of a new job, a new city, and better pay was too good to pass up. Making the decision to leave wasn't easy. I had my life in Husvar, as quiet as it had become. But the excitement of a fresh start, of new possibilities, outweighed the fear of the unknown. So I started making plans to head to Oslo, to see what opportunities awaited me there. The day I left for Oslo, I remember feeling a mix of nerves and excitement. It was a long drive, about five hours from Husvar, but the thought of what lay ahead kept me going. The journey was uneventful, just me and the road, with plenty of time to think about my decision. By the time I reached Oslo, I was ready for whatever came next. Meeting Tobias again after so long was great. He showed me around, introduced me to his boss, and by the end of the day, I had submitted my job application. Things were looking up. We spent the rest of the day catching up, talking about old times and new beginnings. It was late when I realized how much time had passed. Saying goodbye to Tobias, I set off on the journey back to Husvar, unaware that the night ahead would be anything but ordinary. Little did I know that drive back would change everything. It would be a night I'd never forget a night that would test my limits in ways I never imagined. But that's a story for another time. Leaving Oslo, the road stretched out in front of me like a dark ribbon cutting through the night. The visit had gone better than I could have hoped. A job opportunity was on the horizon, and the thrill of starting over in a new country filled me with a sense of adventure. But as the city lights faded in my rearview mirror, a creeping unease began to settle in. I chalked it up to the late hour, 
and the long drive ahead. Little did I know, my sense of unease was a prelude to the nightmare that awaited me. The first hour was uneventful, the monotony of the highway broken only by the occasional passing car. It was a clear night, the full moon casting an eerie glow over the dense forests flanking the road. I remember thinking how beautiful it was, in a haunting sort of way. That's when I noticed the headlights in my mirror. At first, it was just another car on the road, a mundane detail in the quiet of the night. But as it drew closer, something about it felt off. It was a Volvo 240, an old model, its presence behind me suddenly ominous. It followed too closely, its headlights a pair of glaring eyes in the dark. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself it was just another traveler, perhaps in a hurry to get wherever they were going. But when the road cleared and they didn't pass, my discomfort grew. The Volvo made its move then, accelerating past me only to pull in front and slow down, forcing me to brake hard. My heart raced as I swerved to avoid a collision, confusion and fear mingling in my gut. They sped off, and for a moment, I thought that was the end of it. I couldn't have been more wrong. They were playing a game, and I was the unwilling participant. Over and over they would overtake me, stop abruptly, and start again. Each maneuver more aggressive, more threatening. I tried to lose them, speeding up, slowing down, but nothing worked. They were relentless. Panic set in when the Volvo blocked me from taking an exit. Trapped on the highway with them, I felt utterly alone. My attempts to call for help were futile. The Swedish emergency number was useless in Norway, and my call to my dad only added to my frustration. He didn't grasp the severity of the situation, his advice to stop and talk to them sounding ludicrous in my ears. I was in a high-speed chase with strangers who seemed intent on causing me harm. Why were they targeting me? What did they want? I had no answers, only a growing fear that this might not end well. The highway stretched on, a silent witness to my desperation. The ordeal on the bridge was a moment of sheer terror. The thought of losing control, of crashing through the railing and plummeting to the water below was paralyzing. But somehow, I made it across my pursuers still on my tail. When I finally saw the truck stop, a glimmer of hope pierced my fear. I turned off, thinking I had escaped them. But as I would soon find out, my nightmare was far from over. The Volvo didn't follow me into the truck stop, but the relief was short-lived. They were out there somewhere, waiting. And as I sat in my car, trying to calm my racing heart, I knew the night had more horrors in store for me. As I sat there in the parking lot of the truck stop, catching my breath, I thought the worst was behind me. How naive I was. The brief moment of respite was just the calm before the storm. The eerie silence around me felt like the world was holding its breath, waiting for what would come next. And sure enough, the nightmare resumed with a vengeance. Leaving the safety of the truck stop, I merged back onto the highway, my eyes darting nervously to the rearview mirror. For a few minutes, there was nothing. Then, like a bad omen, the Volvo reappeared, its headlights cutting through the darkness, a harbinger of the renewed chase. The game of cat and mouse escalated, their tactics grew more aggressive, more dangerous. Each time they overtook me they would break hard, trying to force me into an accident. My heart pounded against my ribcage, adrenaline surging through me as I swerved and dodged narrowly avoiding collision each time. The road became a battlefield, and I was desperately outmaneuvered at every turn. The feeling of being hunted, of being prey, was unlike anything I had ever experienced. It was terrifying, exhausting, and utterly bewildering. Why me? What did these people want? My mind raced with questions that had no answers, only the stark reality of the situation. I was being pursued by individuals who seemed intent on causing me harm, and I was alone. Desperation led me to make decisions I never thought I'd have to consider. At one point, I found myself tailing another car, hoping there was safety in numbers. But it was no use. The Volvo simply overtook us both, their intentions clear. My temporary companion sped away, leaving me once again to face my pursuers alone. 
I tried to call for help again, this time using my phone to reach my dad, but the conversation was futile. He couldn't grasp the gravity of my situation, his calm advice sounding surreal against the backdrop of my panic. Frustration and fear mingled as I realized I was on my own, with no help coming. The pursuit continued, each mile stretching out endlessly. Every turn of the road, every shadow in the moonlight became a potential threat. The Volvo's occupants were relentless, their maneuvers increasingly daring and dangerous. It was a high-speed dance with danger, and I was faltering. The bridge incident was a turning point. As I sped across the suspension bridge, the realization that I might not make it out of this alive hit me like a physical blow. The thought of my car crashing through the railing, of falling into the abyss below, was terrifyingly real. But somehow, I made it across, the Volvo still in pursuit. The truck stop appeared like an oasis in the desert, a beacon of hope. I turned off, hoping to lose my pursuers in the maze of parked trucks and dark corners. But as I soon discovered, my ordeal was far from over. The brief sense of security was shattered as I realized the Volvo had not given up. They were out there, waiting, and the chase was about to intensify. As I sat in my car, waiting for the police that never came, the reality of my situation sank in. I was trapped in a nightmare, and there was no easy way out. The night had more terrors in store for me, and as I prepared to face them, I knew one thing for certain. I had to survive, no matter what. There's something primal about fear, a deep, guttural reaction that strips away all the complexities of life until you're left with just one imperative, survive. That's where I found myself, my back against the wall, or more accurately, against the dark forests that bordered the highway. The game of cat and mouse on the open road had shifted, and I was now the mouse, darting into the shadows in a desperate bid for safety. Leaving the truck stop behind, I dove back onto the highway, the relentless Volvo reappearing like a specter in my rearview mirror. But this time, something inside me snapped. The fear, the adrenaline, it all condensed into a sharp point of resolve. I wasn't going to play their game anymore. I couldn't outrun them on the road, so I had to outsmart them. I took the first exit I saw, not even sure where it led. The Volvo followed, as I knew it would. My heart was pounding so loudly I could barely hear my own thoughts. But amid the panic, a plan began to form. I needed to hide, to disappear so completely that they couldn't find me. The road twisted and turned, leading me deeper into an area I didn't recognize. Then I saw it, a small unmarked path veering off into the woods. It was now or never. I turned off the headlights and swung the car onto the path branches scraping against the doors as I plunged into the darkness. The Volvo sped past, missing my turn in the shadows. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. For the moment, I was safe. But safety was an illusion. I was alone, in the middle of nowhere, with no idea where I was. The car could only take me so far into the underbrush before I had to stop, the path too narrow to continue. I killed the engine and sat in the dark, listening to the eerie silence of the forest. The fear that had been my constant companion on the road morphed into something else in the woods. Paranoia. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, seemed like a signal that they had found me. I couldn't stay in the car. It was a sitting duck, an easy target if they came back. Grabbing my wallet and keys, I stepped out into the cool night air. The forest loomed large around me an impenetrable wall of darkness. But it was my best chance. I needed to hide, to wait them out until morning. So, I ran. I ran without direction, without purpose, driven only by the need to put as much distance between me and the road as possible. Eventually, exhaustion forced me to stop. I found myself in a small clearing, a large rock under an even larger tree offering a semblance of shelter. With the last of my strength, I climbed onto the rock, and then into the tree, the branches sturdy enough to support me. Hidden by leaves, I tried to calm my racing heart, to think about what comes next, but all I could focus on was the immediate, the visceral fear of being found. As night deepened, 
the forest settled into an uneasy quiet. I strained my ears for any sound that might indicate they were near, but heard nothing. Maybe I had lost them for good. Maybe they had given up. Or maybe they were just biding their time. I didn't know, couldn't know. All I could do was wait, hope, and survive until the dawn. The night was long, filled with imagined noises and the chill of the early morning air. I thought about my family, my friends, and how I had taken my ordinary life for granted. I wondered if I'd ever get the chance to go back to that normalcy. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, I realized something fundamental had changed in me. I wasn't the same person who had set out for Oslo the day before. That Henrik was gone, replaced by someone who had looked into the darkness and survived. But survival was a complex victory, and as the sun rose, I knew my ordeal wasn't over. I had to get back to my car, back to the road, and finally, back home. The journey ahead would be fraught with new challenges, but I was ready. I had to be. The alternative was unthinkable. As the first light of dawn pierced through the dense foliage, coating the forest in a soft, golden hue, I slowly descended from my makeshift sanctuary in the tree. My body ached from the night's ordeal every muscle tense and sore from the fear and the cold. Yet, as I touched the ground, a wave of relief washed over me. I had survived the night, but the reality of my situation was still as stark as the daylight now illuminating my path back to the road. Walking back to where I had left my car felt like retracing the steps of a different person. The forest, now less menacing in the light of day, seemed to whisper echoes of my panic-stricken run. Reaching the car, I half expected to find it vandalized or the Volvo lying in wait, but there was nothing. My car stood untouched, the silence around it a stark contrast to the chaos of the night before. The drive home was a blur. My mind replayed the events over and over, trying to make sense of what had happened. Who were they? What did they want from me? Questions swirled in my head, unanswered and perhaps unanswerable. The relief of escaping my pursuers was tinged with the unease of unknown motives and the realization that my life would never be the same again. Arriving home, I was met with the mundane normalcy of life. The sun was up. People were going about their day, unaware of the terror that had consumed my night. I tried to explain what happened to a few close friends and my family, but words failed to convey the depth of my fear, the surreal nature of being hunted. They listened offered sympathy, and suggested it might have been a case of mistaken identity or a cruel prank gone too far. But none of it made sense. The intensity, the persistence of the chase, it was too personal, too targeted. The following days were a testament to the scars left by that night. Jumping at shadows, flinching at the sound of a car engine, the world seemed a more threatening place. I reported the incident to the police, but without more to go on, it was just another unsolved case. I found myself driving different routes, avoiding the highway, looking over my shoulder. The fear had rooted itself deep within me, coloring every aspect of my life with a tint of paranoia. As time passed, the sharpness of the fear dulled into a constant hum in the back of my mind. I started my new job, met new people, and tried to rebuild a sense of normalcy but the night on the E6 had changed me in ways I'm still trying to understand. The world felt less safe, more unpredictable. I was more cautious, less trusting, always aware of how quickly things could turn. Reflecting on that night, I realize it was a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the strength we possess when faced with our deepest fears. I may never know why I was targeted, what fate I escaped by fleeing into the forest. But I do know that I survived, and in that survival, I found a resilience I never knew I had. Life moves on, and so have I, but the memories of that night linger, a shadowy backdrop to my existence. It taught me to cherish the ordinary, to find strength in adversity, and to always, always listen to the instincts that scream for survival. My ordeal on the E6 remains a defining moment a chapter of my life I can never erase, only learn from. And as I face the future, I carry with me the lessons of that night, a silent testament to the will to survive.
I hadn't wanted to leave Seattle, but the uneasy tone in my mother's voice over the phone had sealed my fate. Sarah, I'm worried about your Aunt Bet, she'd said, her words heavy with a concern that brooked no argument. So here I was, trading the festive anticipation of New Year's at the Space Needle for the stark, snowy expanse of rural countryside, all to check on my mother's oldest sister, my Aunt Bet. The Empire Builder had carried me away from my plans, my city, and deposited me in Fargo, where a bus and then a loner car from a mechanic named Dave in Spearfish completed my reluctant pilgrimage. Dave, with his red-embroidered name tag and a concerned frown about the impending storm, had seemed oddly significant in that moment. His advice to park the car indoors now felt like a harbinger of the isolation to come. The drive to Aunt Bet's farmhouse was a journey through a monochrome world, where fields of snow stretched endlessly, bordered by fences strung with ice. The house itself appeared as a speck against the vast white canvas, its very isolation a silent testament to Aunt Bet's widowhood and the years that had stretched thin since Uncle Bill's passing. Upon my arrival, the chill of the outside world was quickly replaced by the warmth of Aunt Bet's wood-burning stove and her tight embrace. Yet, as I pulled back to study her face, the changes in her struck me, pale, lined, and the short, ragged cut of her gray hair. Dressed in workwear that hung loosely on her frame, she seemed a shadow of the aunt I remembered. Our supper, a simple affair of reheated stew, was punctuated by talk of mundane things, gas prices, holiday plans gone awry. Yet beneath the banalities, a current of unspoken anxiety ran deep. Aunt Bet's mention of being taken advantage of, her sudden focus on the cellar door, the way she looked at me with a mix of fear and resignation, all of it unsettled me. As the wind howled outside, signaling the storm's arrival, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled in my bones. The house, with its creaking floorboards and the lonely whistle of the wind, felt alive with secrets. Secrets that Aunt Bet was determined to keep, even from me. That first night, as I lay in the guest room trying to find sleep amidst the storm's fury, I couldn't help but feel trapped. The farmhouse, once a place of childhood summers and laughter, now felt like a cage. And as I drifted into a restless sleep, the sound of the wind seemed almost like whispers, warning me of what was to come. The morning would bring the storm in full force, the world outside transformed into an unrecognizable landscape of snow and silence. But it was the silence within the house that I would come to fear most, a silence heavy with things unsaid and dangers unseen. As I stood at the window, watching the blizzard erase the world I knew, I realized that my journey here was no mere family obligation. It was a descent into a mystery that had swallowed my Aunt Bet whole. And whether I liked it or not, I was now a part of it. The blizzard had transformed the landscape overnight into an alien world of white. Inside, the farmhouse felt like a ship adrift at sea, isolated and buffeted by the storm. The warmth of the previous evening's wood stove had settled into a chill that seemed to seep from the very bones of the house. I awoke to silence, a profound, enveloping quiet that seemed unnatural, even for a farmhouse miles from the nearest neighbor. It was the kind of silence that presses in on you, making the occasional creaks and groans of the old structure all the more startling. My sleep had been fitful, troubled by dreams that slipped away from me like smoke, leaving behind only a residue of unease. I lay there in the dim morning light, trying to gather my thoughts, when the first sounds broke the silence. Footsteps. Not the light, familiar tread of Aunt Bet, but something heavier, deliberate. They moved down the hallway outside my door, pausing, then returning. My heart thumped against my ribs, a primal fear rising unbidden. When my bedroom door creaked open, I barely managed to stifle a gasp, my breath caught in a throat suddenly dry with terror. The intruder, a presence felt rather than seen in the darkened room, paused, and I could hear the labored breath, the barely perceptible sound of fabric shifting. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the presence withdrew, the footsteps receding along the creaking floorboards. 
I waited, my body rigid with fear, until the silence returned. Only then did I dare to move, locking the door with hands that trembled uncontrollably. The safety of the lock was illusory, but it allowed me to breathe again, to try and make sense of the night's terror. It was clear to me then that Aunt Bet and I were not alone in the house. The morning brought no relief, only a heavy sense of foreboding. Aunt Bet was her usual self, stoic and practical, as we sat down to breakfast. But when I recounted the night's events, I saw something flicker in her eyes. A momentary glimpse of fear quickly masked. Her evasive answers did nothing to ease my mind. As the day wore on, the storm outside raged unabated, the howling wind a constant reminder of our isolation. It was in this oppressive atmosphere that I made a chilling discovery. A seemingly innocent exploration of the house revealed a dark secret. A hole in the wall, hidden behind one of Aunt Bet's dolls. Peering through it revealed not the expected darkness but an eye, bloodshot and watching. Panic took hold then, a visceral clawing thing that demanded action. My flight through the house, a desperate search for Aunt Bet, ended in a locked door and silence from within her room. The realization that we were not alone, that someone, or something, was living among us, hidden within the very walls, was a terror beyond imagining. The cellar became my reluctant destination, driven by a need to understand, to find answers. What I discovered there was a horror beyond words, a den of sorts, littered with the detritus of a hidden occupant. Among the clutter were dolls, each mutilated, twisted into grotesque parodies of their former selves. It was a tableau of madness, a physical manifestation of the malevolence that had invaded our home. As I stood in the dim light of the cellar, surrounded by the evidence of our unseen cohabitants' depravity, I knew fear in a way I had never before experienced. It was a fear not just for my own safety, but for Aunt Bet, for what might come with the next creak of the floorboards, the next opening of a door. We were trapped, not just by the storm outside, but by the darkness that had found its way inside. The realization that we were trapped with a madman lurking within the very walls of the farmhouse was like a vice tightening around my chest. The storm outside raged on, indifferent to the horrors unfolding within. Aunt Bet, the once indomitable force of my childhood, now seemed fragile, a reflection of the fear that gnawed at us both. After my harrowing discovery in the cellar, the day passed in a blur of unease and whispered conversations. Aunt Bet's attempts at normalcy felt like the last vestiges of hope flickering in a gusting wind. We spoke of the weather, of trivial matters, anything to avoid acknowledging the terror that stalked us unseen. But terror, like any beast, grows bolder with silence. It was on the night of December 24th that it bared its teeth. The evening had settled into a heavy quiet, broken only by the occasional howl of the wind. Aunt Bet had retired early, leaving me alone with my thoughts in the flickering shadows of the fire. I tried to lose myself in a book, but the words blurred into meaningless shapes, my mind consumed by fear. It was then that I heard it, a scuffle, a muffled cry from Aunt Bet's room. My heart lurched, panic seizing me as I rushed to her door, only to find it locked from the inside. The sounds of struggle grew, desperate and chillingly personal. I called her name, pounding on the door, but the only answer was a sickening silence that followed a final, haunting cry. In that moment, I knew. The unseen had made itself known. With the lantern as my only ally, I navigated the darkened hallways of the farmhouse. Every creek, a potential harbinger of my own demise. The storm outside seemed to mock my plight, the wind howling in chorus with the pounding of my heart. The kitchen was where I found her, Aunt Bet, her body a testament to the violence that had claimed her. The sight of her, lifeless and bathed in the crimson evidence of her struggle, was a blow from which I would never recover. My scream was lost in the storm, a futile outcry against the injustice of her fate. It was then that he emerged, the architect of our nightmare, his presence a palpable force of malevolence. The flashlight he wielded cut through the darkness, pinning me like a specimen under glass. His grip was iron 
his breath a fetid whisper against my skin as he spoke of disposing Aunt Bet's body in the snow, a chilling plan spoken with the casual indifference of a monster. But it was his final declaration, uttered with a cold certainty, that froze my blood. See, I only need one of you. The words were a death sentence, a proclamation of my own pending doom, unless I could find the strength to fight, to survive. The struggle that ensued was primal, a fight for life itself. I used every ounce of strength, every scrap of desperation to fend him off, to keep the darkness at bay. The farmhouse, once a haven of childhood summers, had become an arena of survival, each moment a battle against the encroaching night. As the storm raged outside, I fought for every breath, every heartbeat. The outcome of this battle was uncertain, but one truth was clear. I would not go gently into that good night. I would fight for Aunt Bet, for myself, for the flickering flame of hope that stubbornly refused to be extinguished.